Hi, welcome to part 12 on the Lackawanna Cutoff, where we're going to be talking about freight trains over the cutoff. Hi, I'm Chuck Walsh, and I'm president of the North Jersey Rail Commuter Association. And we're here on top of Garrett Mountain, overlooking Patterson, New Jersey, and in the far distance, New York. You're probably wondering what we're doing at Garrett Mountain. What does that have to do with the Lackawanna Cutoff? And actually, it has a lot to do with the Lackawanna Cutoff. Now, in the distance here, you can see Route 80, uh, which is the main highway in, in northern New Jersey, runs from just west of the George Washington Bridge all the way to the Oakland Bay Bridge uh, in San Francisco. From here, below us, is Route 19. Now you're wondering, what am I getting into talking about highways for? Well, Route 19 and Route 80, following this particular alignment, was the Booten Line, or in the days that it was built, the Booten Branch of the Lackawanna Railroad. Over which all freight from Hoboken, Secaucus, you know, to east on the Lackawanna, went west to Port Morris and over the cutoff. Now the Booten Branch was built 1869-1870 and was a bypass to the Morristown line. And in this segment we're going to visit Denville, we'll show you the relationship there, the Morristown line and the Booten Branch. But the Booten Branch was essentially a cutoff, a cutoff between the west side of the Bergen Tunnels, just outside of Hoboken, and Denville. And for almost a hundred years was the main freight line in northern New Jersey for the Lackawanna. Now, when the cutoff was built, trains were, had been running over the Booten branch back and forth for over 40 years. It was a low grade line, had very few grade crossings, and went through this it wasn't called a notch per se, but it was a gap between Garrett Mountain and Goffle Hill, which is north, but basically parallel. This is the, the Watchung Range in New Jersey. And there are actually a series of gaps, all that were railroads have taken advantage of the, the different gaps in the Watchung Range. You have the next one down, which is Great Notch, which the Erie uh, used for its Greenwood Lake branch. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to Mountain View, which will be essentially our next stop. And the Marstown line itself actually used a gap uh, between Milburn, Springfield, Summit, up in, up in that neck of the woods. But this was really a key place for the railroad to go through, and in fact, it actually took advantage of another gap west of here. So when the, the builders of the Booten Branch were contemplating this particular line, they knew that this is one place they needed to go through. Now, how does this all impact the cutoff? Well, yes, it was the, the freight line for a number of years that uh, trains over the cutoff would come east and would go through here through Patterson, around this sweeping curve through the, the gap over here, and westbound the same way. Fast forward to the early 60s, and this is after the merger between the Erie and the Lackawanna, creating the Erie-Lackawanna Railroad. And remember we talked about this in rails under and over the, the cutoff, that segment, where in 1960, when there was the merger that the management, which was primarily Erie people uh, who took over the Erie Lackawanna, who became part of the Erie Lackawanna management, shifted 
virtually all freight traffic from here up via the Erie, which actually would go in this trajectory and that way, at, way to the east of where we are here for the most part. By 1963, the Erie Lackawanna in the previous two years had lost $43 million. They would lose another 15 or 20 in 1963. But in 1963, there was an opportunity presented to them where they could make money by selling off this section of the Booten Branch to the New Jersey Highway Department. Uh, the New Jersey Highway Department would later become the Department of Transportation, the New Jersey DOT. But in those days, they were the Highway Department. Now, the Highway Department really, really, really wanted to have this access to this gap here. As you can see, this is Route 80. The Route 80 goes right through here. However, the Lackawanna, or in this, at that point, the Erie Lackawanna, had two tracks that went through that gap. And in fact, I've had a couple of conversations with my friend John Wolliver, who he worked originally for the Lackawanna and then got a job with the Highway Department in the um, like 1956, 1957, and actually was part of the team that was tasked with condemning land to create Route 80. And he told me the story that the then commissioner of the, or whatever the head of the highway department was called in those days, came to the right-of-way team or division and said that, the, and they had been condemning land adjacent to the Booten Branch. In other words, they were not at that point contemplating taking the, the right-of-way of the Booten Branch, as would eventually happen. But the commissioner had come up with a brilliant idea that, well, why don't we see if the Erie Lackawanna might be willing to set, sell part of the right-of-way? And at that point, as I mentioned, the Erie Lackawanna is, is in, in the red and, and, and desperate straits as far as cash is concerned. So what happens is that the, the highway department approaches the Erie Lackawanna and offers that money to, to buy the right-of-way. And because at that point in time, the Erie Lackawanna had shifted all freight traffic away from the Booten Branch, they figured, oh, we don't really need this. And we can make a bunch of money. Actually, it would turn out to be like $2 million, but in, we're talking now 55 years ago. So uh, $2 million was quite a bit of money in those days. And it would have at least helped somewhat toward the bottom line. However, the decision was going to come back to haunt the Erie Lackawanna big time and come back to, to haunt the cutoff, as a matter of fact, as well. But in any case, to finish the story with John Wilver, what, what happened was then they, the, the, the highway department worked out a deal where the, the Erie Lackawanna could keep one track. Now, this is where the story gets a little muddy, and then I'm going to give my opinion on what actually happened here. The Erie Lackawanna eventually ended up selling the entire right-of-way. In other words, Route 80, there's no tracks anywhere, by, but we'll, we'll actually show you where, or at least we'll try to show you along the section of where there were tracks. But the Erie Lackawanna basically was willing to dump this right-of-way to get their $2 million. Uh, but the the highway department really didn't expect that that was going to happen. Now, the story that has always been told publicly has been that the, depart the, uh, the highway department was only willing to give the EL, the Erie Lackawanna, money in the event that they sold the entire right-of-way and, and didn't keep any tracks. But that can't be possibly true, and here's why. In eminent domain, which is you know, another word for condemnation, in eminent domain, the condemning party, in this case it would be the state, state of New Jersey, the highway department, is obligated to pay 
the landowner, in this case the Erie Lackawanna, fair market value for whatever they take, be it land, could be right-of-way, could be buildings, whatever the case may be. So to say that they would, they would leave room for one track, in other words, they take right-of-way and only leave one track behind, means that they would have taken, and this is a section at several miles, as a matter of fact, I'm going to guess three, four miles of right-of-way, they would have to pay the Erie Lackawanna, they'd be obligated legally to pay the Erie Lackawanna for what they took, irrespective of what it took to somehow get one track to go through this section with highway ramps that were going to be built and um, the, the highways themselves and so forth. So basically the story that somehow that the, the Erie Lackawanna wasn't going to get any money for leaving one track behind is nonsense. Absolute nonsense. It's, 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 it, it cannot be. It's legally impossible. My opinion, what happened was that the Erie Lackawanna made up that story to justify them dumping the whole section of track and selling it off to the state of New Jersey. I think that's what happened. And the story that's been told over the years, and it's been repeated, it's in uh, Thomas Tabor's book, um, I've seen it in other books as well, is, in my view, untrue. It's false. A lie, if you wish. It's basically, that's what it is. Now, how does this affect the cutoff? Well, in 1963, October of 1963, the last trains come through here and they start tearing up the track and the right-of-way and planning for the highway and so forth. Now what happens is that there's several different changes that are made to the traffic patterns uh, for the Erie Lackawanna. Now the first one is, of course, well, this is no longer an operation, the Booten Branch or the Booten Line as it would become. And in the distance, you can't really make it out, per se, but there's the, the, what is now called the main line for New Jersey Transit runs through here and, and actually connects into what, uh, well, what is remaining of the Booten Branch East, timetable east, really south of here, in this direction. West of where the line was severed, uh, a spur was left in, what they call the Total Industrial Spur all the way to Mountain View, which will be our next stop. At Mountain View, the Booten Branch crossed at right angles with the Greenwood Lake branch of the Erie, the former Erie, as I mentioned. The Greenwood Lake would now become the Booten Line and would shift over, which we'll show you, onto what it was originally the Booten Branch at Mountain View. We'll have maps to show you, this is a little bit confusing, but essentially what happens and what part of the justification for this particular change, if we will, of operating patterns for the Erie Lackawanna was, oh, the city of Patterson still has train service. The, the line going up through Great Notch and Mountain View still runs and the rest of the Boone Line will still have passenger service west of Mountain View. However, what was lost was a high-grade or high-speed freight line between these points. The, to use as an analogy, the Greenwood Lake Branch was similar to basically the old road when you compare this to, let's say, the cutoff. That was the difference. And, the, and an, an added difference was that it, not only was it like the old road to the cutoff, the Greenwood Lake to the Booten Branch, but there was also heavy commuter a action that was taking place every day on the Greenwood Lake Branch. So as a result, freight trains would have to somehow weave in and out, if you will, between heavy commuter operations. So that's where things stood through the 60s and into the early 70s. We talked about, and once again, rails under and over the cutoff, about the Erie side and all the traffic being moved over there. 
Well, guess what? It didn't exactly work out that that was the best plan in the long run. The so-called New England gateway dries up. The, the, the Penn Central merger causes a change in freight patterns, which means basically the whole justification for using the Erie side now no longer exists. So as we get into the early and mid-70s, the Erie Lackawanna is now forced to move all its freight traffic back onto the Booten Line, not the Booten Branch, because the Booten Branch is gone, the Booten Line, and now have to run trains basically on a heavily used commuter line with a heavy grade going in and out of Great Notch, which is basically going through the same Wachung Mountains, only it's, it's um, much more of a heavy grade going up there. This, this is a much better gap. That's why the Lackawanna chose this gap to go through, not where the uh, Greenwood Lake went through at Great Notch. So as we go through the 70s, the Erie Lackawanna is, is basically stuck now with this this line, which if they had not ab abandoned the Booten Branch, they wouldn't have to have that problem. Now, how does this affect the cutoff? Well, it affects it big time. Because after Conrail takes over, in other words, the Erie Lackawanna and 600 railroads in the Northeast are conveyed into Conrail as of April 1, 1976. This line now, well, it's not even this line, but the line that the Greenwood Lake Branch, Booten Line, as it was called, now becomes basically an albatross. And Conrail sticks with it for know, about basically two years, more or less. Maybe a little more, two and a half years. And then shuts down the operation using this. At least this is what they said, whether it was true or not. We believe them or not, but Conrail said the main reason why abandoned this entire route for the Erie Lackawanna, including the cutoff, because of this, the Booten branch, because the branch was removed. So that, that short-sighted move back in 1960 came back to haunt the Erie Lackawanna. Yeah, it came back to haunt the Erie Lackawanna and the cutoff, big time. That's to Garrett Mountain just to discuss the implications of a move that took place now 55 years ago and caused the abandonment of, well, it didn't cause the abandonment, of the freight-wise it did, but there was still passenger traffic on the line so that the state of New Jersey ended up ironically taking over most of the operation, but was at, now we're talking 1979, was only a freight route at that point. And as we'll get into in subsequent segments, we'll talk about the effort to try to bring back the cutoff uh, using passenger service, maybe talking about freight service at that time, but uh, this long predates the, the current effort, which, you know, in the, in the modern time, 2017. But we'll talk about all that history. There's still a lot to talk about at the cutoff that we haven't even gotten into. We haven't really even touched for that matter. But a lot of it comes back to here. Garrett Mountain, Route 80, Route 19, that took over the right-of-way and basically changed the, the freight operation on the former Lackawanna line forever. There's no way to bring this back. I mean, you, Maybe you could think about 100 years or who knows how many years. At some point, highways will be now abandoned in favor of rail lines. Now, that could happen, but that's not something I'd bet on happening anytime soon, of course. But in the long term, maybe that will happen, but in the short term, impossible, basically. So that's the story. That's the story behind Garrett Mountain and the Lackawanna and the Booten Branch. So we're going to take a trip now to our next stop, which is Mountain View, and we'll point out the relationship between the Booten Branch, the Greenwood Lake, and the Booten Line, and what is now called the Montclair Booten Line.
So, here we are at Mountain View. Now, as I mentioned, when we were back at Garrett Mountain, the Booten Line, this is the Booten Line, or the Booten Branch, this is looking east towards Garrett Mountain, Patterson, Hoboken, New York, and west is that way towards, and I'm going to actually walk around, Morris Canal ran, I believe, right over in here, as a matter of fact. Uh, this is the station area where the actual crossing with the Erie, or the Greenwood Lake branch of the Erie, is up the track a piece. We're going to visit there next, just to give you some perspective. So as of October of 1963, freight trains stopped going through here, through freights local service still still actually exists. You can see that, that the, uh, the tracks are still shiny. The tracks do go several miles as far as Totowa uh, in, in that neck of the woods. And then basically used to dead end actually almost literally next to Route 80 where it almost seemed like the tracks were going to go right on to the highway right of way. But um, I believe most of those tracks now have been removed. That's, that's a number of years ago. In any case, We'll give you some perspective of what happened here, but this used to be two tracks. The, originally, the plan was to have four tracks here, but that was never done. Uh, the station here uh, was like 1903, was an early station, was here. And certainly would have been discontinued as of 1963 at the, the very latest uh, because of the cessation of all through traffic, not only just because this was a passenger route as well. We've talked about freight, but this passenger service used this as well and would shift over to the Greenwood Lake Branch. So Greenwood Lake Branch is our next stop. The crossing, as it were, doesn't look like it did at one time, but where the two lines crossed each other at grade. Here we are at Mountain View, and we're going to show you what the track arrangement is now. One time, the Booten Branch came across through here and continued on. As you can see, we had New Jersey Transit train coming up the tracks behind me. I'm not going to try to compete with him. Now what's happening is that he is now going on to the last piece of the Greenwood Lake Branch and now a entering what became a connector. And probably by the time I finish the next sentence, that train will be on the original Booten line, what, where it continues on from Mountain View. Now, uh, that train just stopped at the Mountain View station, it's former Erie station, Erie Lackawanna, as of 1963. All trains shifted, went back and forth, shall we say. Um, freights and passenger trains along this section of line. Now the section here that I'm standing on is essentially a Y track for all intents and purposes. It comes off of the the branch, continues up here. Now this is the original 
Greenwood Lake Branch I'm standing on. Now I'm facing north. This continued on to, well, Greenwood Lake. That's why they called it Greenwood Lake Branch. Now you can see another track which comes back and goes in that direction. That's the connector to the boot and branch, what's left of it east of here. This is west of Mountain View. And New Jersey Transit goes back and forth this way. Now the question about the combining of routes, that occurred in 1963. There's also been a further combining that's taken place. For, well, since the, the Lackawanna, uh, or the, I should say the Morris and Essex, had a Booton, I, I correct myself, a Montclair branch which went to Montclair. In 2002, more or less 80 years after it was first uh, uh, suggested as a, a, a connection, a connection was made from the Greenwood Lake branch, which connected into the Montclair branch of the, the old Lackawanna, creating what is now the montclair Booton line. So what happens is that the trains that, let's say, were going in this direction, eastbound, when they get to Montclair, they switch off of the, what is the Greenwood Lake, onto a connector track called the Montclair Connection, and then go onto the Montclair branch of the, well, what used to be the Lackawanna, or now is the Morris and Essex of uh, lines of New Jersey Transit, then goes into Newark Broad Street, and, and then into Hoboken, or could possibly go into New York from there as well. So the tra that traffic pattern has changed. What's significant about that is, because there's been talk about, well, what happens if you reactivate the cutoff? Would there be long freights that could possibly go over the cutoff? Well, the question is, where would they come from? There's no place, the Booten branch is gone. This is impossible. This, this line dead ends a few miles from here, as we've seen. And to, in this direction, the Greenwood Light branch was bad enough when it was being operated by the Erie Lackawanna as a last resort with heavy commuter operations. But since the shifting of the connection at Montclair so that the line now goes down the, the electrified Montclair branch, that means there's overhead wires, catenary, that are energized, and the original Greenwood Lake, which went to Croxton Yard, which is where the Erie Lackawanna ran its freights out of, can't get there anymore. So as a result, this line, in terms of any kind of freight usage, may be a little bit of local freight. Yes, this is a, a freight spur. There is some local freight, but that's it. The days of the long freights of 100 plus car trains are, are long over. They will never see that here again. Just not possible. So, in any case, um, that is Mountain View. So our next stop, the far end, if you will, of the Booten Branch. It connects with the Morristown Line, and that's at Denville Junction. Here we are at Denville Junction as a Mar train is about to leave. So that train is either headed for Dover or Netcong or maybe even Hackettstown as its last stop. This is the Morristown line.
And on this side is the western end of the Boaten Line, what is now the Montclair Boaten Line, and at one time was called the Boaten Branch. Now trains off of the Boaten Line will go basically on to what is the Morristown Line, they combine here. Now the setup here has actually changed dramatically over the years. Originally, and when the, the Boulton Branch was built, it actually came straight through, as it does now, but the Marstown line actually, and I will go and turn around here, actually came through where this parking lot is and crossed and actually didn't even connect in. It just crossed through, went up around to Rockaway and came back in at what they call East Dover. And that was where the connection back into the Morristown line was made. So uh, this was a, at one time, and freight times was a real busy place. Uh, it was a, I'd say, enormously complicated. You still had the two tracks here, but you had four tracks going west of here. Uh, there are only two tracks now, but they had two, there were two electrified tracks. I'm going to turn around again. You can see the, the catenary here. And maybe do just a quick explanation what catenary is. The catenary are these the overhead wires that deliver electricity to trains. Now the train that just left it didn't um, was a diesel powered train, so that wasn't a train that requires overhead catenary. But the, the catenary continues on the two tracks to the left, and then there were two tracks to the right. And now we got a Bolton Line train coming. So now we're going to go around the other way again. Now, if we get a, a view of the catenary or I should say the pantograph up on top of here, up on top of the engine, uh, that's been pulled down because the boot line is not electrified, at least the western portion of the boot line is not electrified. Uh, part of it is all the way to Montclair State University is, and then uh, the rest of the line is not electrified, so therefore they pull the pantograph, which is the, the thingy that touches the wire. Um, 25,000 volts of a alternating current. Um, when I said this was a busy spot, I meant it. Here comes now an eastbound train while the westbound train leaves. Now this is busy now. Can you imagine back in the day with with freight trains coming through, it was a, a rail fan's delight to be here. Now this eastbound train, uh, these are arrow multiple, no they're not. This is a regular old push-pull type of deal. And, uh, He's rendering under diesel as well, so he doesn't have the catenary up. So anyway, unfortunately we can't show you a, a train with, uh, with catenary because one of the issues with running trains, freight trains east of here, talking about the Morristown line, which has been done in the past, uh, but only under basically emergency conditions. You have the overhead catenary which restricts the height of any train. Uh, not so much here, but much further east of here is a problem. At Roseville Avenue, not Roseville Tunnel, Roseville Avenue, which is near Newark, uh, it's 
That's actually a Metro North locomotive that's uh, pushing that train. Um, but to complete the thought about the, the overhead catenary, uh, at Roseville Avenue in Newark, it restricts the height of everything, basically. Actually, the, the train cars, we haven't seen any of the, the double-deckers yet, but the, the double-deckers, which would be the tallest cars that New Jersey Transit would have, because you have two decks, you have seats down here and seats up here, the, 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 the height of those was actually restricted so that they could run under the wires or the catenary at Roseville Avenue, which is under 16 feet, so that really restricts the, the height of the cars and the locomotives, of course, as well, uh, because you need some space, so otherwise you'd have um, 25,000 volts arcing uh, between the train and the, uh, the, the wire. So, in any case, uh, this is Denville, uh, a real hot spot, we can say, as we've just proven in the last couple of minutes, we've seen three different trains. Our next stop, we are finally get back to the cutoff, because I know we've been talking about the cutoff, uh, and the, the, the whole reason for giving a view of the eastern part of the line is to talk about the interaction of freight with the line. The cutoff was built to such a high specification. It's not the issue. It's the the lines east and you know also west. We haven't really talked too much about the west of the cutoff with the Pocono Mountains. That was an issue as well, which we'll get into other uh, in, in future episodes. But at least for now, to give you an idea, one of the major issues with trains east of Port Morris. Uh, which we've gone through with Garrett uh, Mountain, uh, and freight trains specifically, not so much passenger, although um, passenger has been indirectly affected by that particular change in, in operating, you know, alignment, you know, where the, basically where the railroad goes. So, but onward to Port Morris, and hopefully the weather will be better there. Uh, if not, then, uh, well, we'll just, we'll, at some point, we will definitely continue on at Port Morris. Here we are at Port Morris Yard, Port Morris Y. The, the weather has cleared up, fortunately. If we look at the cutoff, which is just on the other end of the yard going in this direction, uh, to orient you, this is towards Lake Apacon Station. The cutoff in that direction is Netcom. And this is all of the, the yard, which part of which is being used by New Jersey Transit for various purposes. As you can see, there are uh, lots of railroad ties and um, various kinds of junk, I guess you could say. This is Port Morris Y, which is connection between the cutoff, which is back there, and the the yard itself, of course. Now this Y was opened at the same time that the cutoff was built, opened in 1911, and was the conduit for trains coming in and off of the cutoff that were going to come into the yard here. Uh, for example, in 1913, the Lackawanna experimented with an incredibly long train for that time, a 132-car coal train, which they ran from Slateford to Port Morris. It would have come in here because this was a distribution point. And that train just barely made it. It had three locomotives on front and two pushers. The, the train had to stop several times because of the uh, several couplers broke under all that weight. Eight, I think it was 8,000 tons, which is a, a large train. And that was an experiment that Lackawanna would never repeat. They, they learned that that was just too big of a train, at least for the technology. The, the couplers just couldn't withstand that kind of torque, you know, that kind of weight that was being uh, applied onto them. Over the years, the, this, this yard served certainly 
various purposes. One of its main uses, and this would even, I, I guess, predate the, the cutoff, because this yard goes back into the 1880s, 1870s, was what they called less than car load freight, LCL as they called it. And what that means is that when various items were being shipped, they would be grouped together with other shippers or receivers that were going to uh, get that particular freight. So if you were shipping a, well, any kind of, um, let's say, an appliance of some sort, of course in those days there wouldn't be that many appliances, maybe a washer, it's possible, um, a clothes washer, or they looked quite a bit different than those days. Uh, but that transfer would have taken place up at, at Port Morris. There was a, an area, the, the LCL area in, in Port Morris up until about 1931, which interestingly enough coincides roughly with the time of the closure of Roseville siding just east of here, a couple miles east of here. It also coincides with the beginning of the, the Depression, the Great Depression of the 1930s. So it may or may not, uh, the, the side and closing may not necessarily be directly related to the closing LCL, although LCL may be directly related to the um, Depression era. Uh, this yard would last until 1960, until the time of the merger after which it would be closed. Uh, the reason why Port Morris closed was because, as I mentioned earlier in this video when we were at Garrett Mountain, the Erie Lackawanna, which took over in October 1960, the Erie Lackawanna management shifted all, basically all freight off onto the former Erie side or the Erie main line, which is now um, today's Bergen County line. Uh, under New Jersey Transit. So that, for example, the Lehigh and Hudson River, which we talked about um, in rails under and over the cutoff, which ran via the Sussex branch into here. The Sussex branch would have come in at the far end of, well, it would have come in at Netcom, but it would have connected in through Netcom at the far end of the the yard here in Port Morris. That also ceased after 1960 because the whole pattern of freight movement for the Erie Lackawanna changed from that of what was previously done under the Lackawanna days. So everything was moved up there, when I say up there, meaning north to Maybrook, where that interchange took place and such that the all of the main traffic up until when we start getting into the mid-70s, uh, when it'll shift back, but up until that time, from the period from 1960-61 into the, the time of the, the great shifting back of everything uh, to the Lackawanna side, um, this, everything here is basically shut down. There's nothing really much of anything going on. Don't know that the Lackawanna or the Erie Lackawanna actually um, had any plans to do anything with Port Morris. There were proposals, as a matter of fact, and this went even uh, later in the time, even to the Conrail years, past 1976. There was talk of using this particular facility as a intermodal type of facility. In other words, the trailers would come in basically truck trailers come in and they would be transferred and, and pulled out by the, the tractor, the tractor trailer. And because of the close proximity of Route 80, Route 46, Route 206, um, trains could have been brought into here, let's say from the west, and they wouldn't have to go all the way into basically uh, the, the far eastern part of the state and then have to be brought back out. They would be out here and wouldn't necessarily have to deal with as much traffic. It would have saved time and so forth. It was never implemented. Uh, it was a great idea, but it, it never got any traction, unfortunately. 
and then in a couple of years, New Jersey Transit became involved, um, and they didn't do anything with this particular property for quite some time, as a matter of fact. They, 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 they had the bridge department here for a number of years, just going into the 80s and into the 90s, as a matter of fact. And then they put in their own yard, which stores train sets uh, for the, the Booten Line, or what became later the Montclair Booten Line, which we just came from at, at, at Denville. So, um, but, but basically when trains, and this was talking once again, going back to the pre-1960 days, uh, trains would have been coming back and forth through here. This would have been probably one of the most heavily used pieces of track in the entire Lackawanna system, this, this wide track, because trains leaving going westbound and trains leaving or coming in eastbound into this yard, not all of them would go in and out. A lot of them would bypass and go onto the cutoff, but some, a lot of them would come in and out of here. And so this, this Y got quite a bit of use, as a matter of fact. Uh, but all that changed once, once the, the Erie Lackawanna took over. And that, as we've talked about, had a dramatic effect. And then you also talk about the severing of the Booten line in Patterson, uh, the closure of Port Morris. So you, you see that there was a pattern here that, and of course it was the shifting of the, the cause of all this, the shifting of the, the traffic to the, the Erie side. Thinking that the money was going to be saved that basically over the long term, um, that in operating over the Erie side was the, the uh, you can argue maybe the best way of, of running the railroad. Uh, it would not stay that way. And as we talked about, when we're talking about now going back to 74, 75, when things were shifted back to the Lackawanna side, uh, becomes very evident that the mistakes of the past have come back to haunt, not only uh, Garrett Mountain, but uh, the well, single tracking of the cutoff, single tracking of parts of the Booten line, as a matter of fact, as well. Uh, just a lot of changes that if there had been a little bit of foresight would have possibly allowed Conrail to continue operation of this line past the time where it decided that it was just going to get rid of it. Now there are complications, and we'll, I guess we can get into this another time because we, we will cover this era in, in greater detail, but just to give you a little bit of a glimpse of what we could talk about when we get to Conrail and uh, the abandonment of the cutoff, uh, that um, Conrail had a heavy influence uh, by, of course, the, the, the Pennsylvania and the New York Central. It was Penn Central at that point, but historically there have been uh, enormous, uh, that they, were, they basically were the reason for Conrail being formed and a lot of other railroads got pulled into that mix and the Erie Lackawanna got pulled in very late as a matter of fact. They weren't originally intended to be part of the Conrail, what became the Conrail merger. Uh, but the, the predecessor railroads in Conrail also had other railroads that they had financial interest in, like uh, the Pennsylvania, for example, had great interest in the uh, Lehigh Valley Railroad, which interesting, maybe not coincidentally, the, after the abandonment of the cutoff, the Lehigh Valley, while it already had become the, one of the, the main routes, well, you could think, well, there's an economic interest that was um, together with that. That's sort of getting your movie. Hi. Hi. But you don't have to pay me. Well, that was interesting. Not sure where he's headed. So in any case, with Conrail, we, we see that the, what became Conrail was made of predecessor roads that actually had ties to the, the main railroads, meaning the Pennsylvania and, the, and New York Central. And we can also talk about some of the influences that the New York Central had on the Lackawanna, and that, that would be another discussion entirely.
So in any case, that's a little bit of a, an overview of Port Mars, its relationship to the Y here, relationship to the cutoff. Our next stop and our last stop is going to be at Roseville Road. We're going to take a look, we're going to discuss a little bit more freight and we'll also talk about the, the new bridge that's there. Here we are at Roseville Road overpass, which you can see is under construction, but it is nearing the end of construction. It should be completed as I speak within the next six weeks about, that's what they're saying. And then the work on the approaches and all that stuff. And uh, this particular roadway, which has been closed now for over a year now, um, should then hopefully reopen shortly thereafter. Now, one of the reasons why we're here is to, to talk about, of course, we're talking about freight, but uh, this is a, an interesting location in terms of a freight accident which occurred on September 17th, 1929. An eastbound freight uh, was coming up the grade and was catching up to another freight which was ahead of it. The engineer in the second freight, and this is from an ICC, Interstate Commerce Commission report, in those days they're the ones who uh, would investigate accidents. Uh, from that report, the engineer of the second freight train uh, was doing somewhere in the neighborhood of about 25 miles an hour when he hit the rear end of the uh, leading freight that was doing 11 miles an hour just on the other side of Roseville Tunnel, which at this point is less than a half a mile away from here. Uh, what's interesting though, a couple of things are interesting uh, about that particular accident. First of all, it's the only accident where there really seems to have been any negligence on the part of any um, person, um, in this case the engineer, uh, of any accident in any way related to the cutoff. Um, uh, there was a derailment in 1960 in Greendale, probably attributable to track conditions or switch or something. But uh, in this case, there was negligence on the part of the engineer. He, he, he passed a restricting signal, in other words, a, a yellow signal. He passed a red signal. He went over two torpedoes, which are basically explosive devices, which you'd have to be basically dead in order to, to miss. And then went through the tunnel and then hit the, the leading train. There was a derailment. Fortunately, nobody was killed. Four people were injured. But um, what's significant, and then this is, wasn't this bridge because this is a replacement bridge and is, is taller than the original bridge, although the alignment is very similar to the original bridge. What's interesting is that there was a signal that was between this bridge and Roseville Tunnel uh, in 1929, it would have been a semaphore signal. And according to the ICC report, they discovered that that particular signal would have been par partially obscured by this bridge when it was in the down position, or maybe the up position, in any position, apparently. That didn't really factor into the uh, the actual accident of itself, we don't think. I mean, they, the engineer should have seen the restricting signal. He should have seen the red signal, even though he might not have seen it initially. He had more than enough time to stop. Uh, he claims, and this was 6.31 in the morning when he hits um, the, the lead train from behind, uh, he claims in, in the report that he was having breakfast, 6.31 in the morning. Um, that sounds rather suspicious, but how, how on earth did he miss the torpedoes, which are like, like M80s going off? It, it's, something was not right with that. But anyway, they, th this accident occurred here, um, probably tied up the cutoff for the day, or at least part of the day until he cleaned up the mess and, and uh, went on from there. Now, um, 
in, in terms of talking about Roosevelt Tunnel, there really were no major operational issues with, with the tunnel per se. And we'll divide the, the use of the tunnel from 1911 up until the, let's say, the early to mid 70s for the Erie Lackawanna days. Uh, in the early days, uh, or up until 1958, where there were two tracks, after 1958, we have a single track, which would have been the eastbound main here. The westbound main would have been over here. In the mid-70s, they, they actually upgrade the cutoff, that's the, the Erie Lackawanna, and they, they move the, the track, the, what was on the eastbound side, they move it to basically the center of the, the tunnel to give greater clearance. Now, the thing about uh, freight trains on the cutoff, you probably want me to mention something about oh, HB1 or HB2, which would be Hoboken, Buffalo freights, the symbol freights going back, or um, ES98 and 99, which were the Elizabeth Port, and I have a bug, unfortunately, flying around, uh, Elizabeth Port uh, to Scranton run, which um, was a joint run after the Central Railroad of New Jersey gave up its operation in Pennsylvania and, and operated trains back and forth uh, between Elizabeth Port on the CNJ, the Central Railroad in New Jersey, uh, over the High Bridge Branch, up through Port Morris and down the cutoff and up and over the Poconos to, to Scranton. Um, I'm not going to get into great detail about all the trains, all the freight trains that ran on this line. Uh, you have to realize, though, that if you go from the time of, let's say, the opening of the cutoff, that the number of freight trains was actually quite large. Um, 40, 45 freights a day was not unusual. As the freights, as the freight cars get larger, the number of freights actually decreases. So we go into like the 30s and 40s, you're talking about maybe 2025. 20, um, at the time of the 29 accident, I think it was like upwards of like 50 trains a day, but that was both passenger and, and freight combined. But as you go into the 60s and 70s, well, we know and what happened in the 60s and 70s, or at least early 60s and into the early 70s, uh, there was basically no freight for all intents and purposes on this line. And then later on, uh, the, the, the freights that were originally being run on the Erie side are moved over here. And then uh, Conrail continues to run freights, but only through uh, the end of 1978. And after that, they, they shut down the line. Uh, so there's no activity at, at all. Of course, passenger had already ended in 1970, so there was no, um, except an occasional special, there was no uh, passenger operation taking place on the cutoff. Um, after 1970. So that's a broad, high-level view of freight activity on the cutoff. So that basically ends this episode. Um, I'm not going to give away what our next episode is, but maybe you can kind of guess, but I'll, I'll leave it to you to, um, to keep that in your mind in, in terms of our episode 13, part 13, but I hope you'll, in the meantime, that you have enjoyed part 12 on the Lackawanna Cutoff. Until next time, we'll see you then. Look forward to part 13 on the Lackawanna Cutoff.